uh, webinar series. Today's webinar is um, phage therapy and mini lungs. Um, firstly, I would like to um, acknowledge uh, country and respectfully acknowledge the Aboriginal people as traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are all meeting today and the areas from which our patients are spiritually connected. We are hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the Gadigal and the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in the East and the Baramatical people of the Darug Nation in the West of Sydney. We acknowledge the strength, wisdom, compassion and care Aboriginal people have for their kinship, language, culture and spiritual connection to country. We pay our respects to the elders, family members and children who are our future leaders. We also acknowledge our community members, our Aboriginal staff and the Aboriginal services and organisations who work closely with us to improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal children and young people, their families and communities. So once again, um, welcome to our Advanced Therapeutics webinar series, focusing on phage therapy and mini lungs. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, a, a video of the webinar has already uh, commenced and will be emailed to all attendees um, as soon as available, um, probably next week. There is a QA and a um, panel uh, who will be able to answer selected questions at the end of the webinar. So please submit your questions through the Q&A tab in the Zoom control. Um, and if you want to upvote that question, please go and uh, click the, the thumbs up. We'll also provide answers to any unanswered questions um, via our website or email um, in days, uh, coming days after the webinar. So today's webinar, we are fortunate in having uh, two um, um, outstanding speakers who are leaders in their respective fields of paediatric infectious disease and stem cell biology, Dr. Amina Katami and Dr. Shafa Waters. Dr. Katami is a paediatric infectious disease specialist and clinical academic um, in infectious disease and microbiology at the Children's Hospital at Westmead and University of Sydney. Dr. Katami was part of a team who were able to access phage therapy to treat a child in Australia a first in the country, and which demonstrated phage therapy to be safe and feasible for paediatric patients. Dr. Katami is um, one of the deputy directors of Phages Australia, which focuses on the rapid translation of phage therapeutics into clinical practice. Dr. Shaffa Waters is the head of molecular and integrative cystic fibrosis research centers laboratory at UNSW and Sydney Children's Hospital at Randwick. Her team established Australia's first CF airway and gut organoid uh, bioresource with clinical data and uh, implemented a multi-analytical uh, platform of in silico molecular uh, dynamic uh, stimulations, in vitro organoid uh, based C C CFTR functional assays and an array of omics technologies, which we'll hear about today. I welcome, first of all, Dr. Katami, who will start this webinar with an overview um, of phage therapy. Uh, Shafa, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, so yes, today I will be talking about phage therapy as an option for difficult to treat infections in pediatrics in particular. So the term bacteriophage essentially means bacterium eater, and it was first coined by Felix Durrell, who is a microbiologist, a French microbiologist, back in 1917. Bacteriophages or phages are viruses that infect and replicate inside bacteria, and as part of that process can cause the bacteria to lyse or break apart. And it's this property that we can exploit as an antimicrobial agent. They're the most diverse and abundant life form on the planet, um, outnumbering bacteria in the order of at least 10 to 1. This um, classical T4 phage that you can see here is a um, E. coli phage and it's a tail DNA virus. But like the viruses that infect humans or animals, um, uh, phage viruses are incredibly diverse and they can be RNA or DNA based genomes, single stranded, double stranded, enveloped or non enveloped. 
and have quite um, simple genomes of only four genes up to very complex um, genomes with hundreds of genes. The bactericide, because phages are so ubiquitous in the environment, um, bactericidal properties of the Ganges and Jumna rivers were first recognized by Ernest Hankin, who's an English scientist um, back in 1896. And oral concentrates of phages were used to treat Shigella enteritis or bacillary um, dysentery by Felix Durrell in 1919. And subsequently, phages were used with varying success to treat a variety of quite serious um, bacterial infections, including typhoid fever, osteomyelitis, staph aureus, bacteremia, and um, endocarditis in the 1920s and 1930s. However, enthusiasm waned with the development of antibiotics in the 1930s, although there was ongoing use of phage therapy in the former Soviet Union. However, much of this older literature is criticized for having quite significant experimental and technical flaws. Phages are quite complementary to antibiotics as antimicrobial um, agents, and they um, offer some very important advantages over antibiotics. The first being is their low toxicity, because they can't attack mammalian cells in any way. Um, they're very safe to use, and actually in over 100 years of phage therapy use, there's never been a single case of anaphylaxis recorded with um, phage therapy. You can sometimes get a brief um, systemic inflammatory response with phage therapy, and this likely um, is related to the predictable release of pro-inflammatory um, uh, cellular components um, like bacterial um, uh, like polysaccharide when the uh, cells are lysed. Because these viruses are very, very host specific, they have minimal impacts on the healthy microbiome. And we know that the human microbiome has um, an important role to play in both health and disease states. Antibiotic induced dysbiosis is very real and actually very poorly understood. And we believe that in the long term may carry consequences for metabolic dysfunction and immune modulation. Similarly, the use of broad spectrum antibiotics um, drives for selection of um, you know, multi-resistant organisms, both amongst the pathogenic um, population at the site of infection, as well as amongst the commensal organisms in the gut, um, skin, and other sites. And this rising antimicrobial resistance is a critical health and global security concern at a population level, but also severely constrains treatment options for individual patients. For phages, they prey equally well on drug susceptible and drug resistant strains um, and aren't really bothered by antibiotic resistance. In addition, specific phages may be used to resensitize bacteria to um, antibiotics they that they had previously become resistant to. Biofilms um, are when bacteria sort of hide within a layer of slime. And they're one of the, these biofilm infections are some of the hardest to treat. And they occur, for example, in the lungs of people with cystic fibrosis, particularly those who are colonized with pseudomonas. They are also characteristic of um, in infections of prosthetic devices, so prosthetic joints, spinal rods, cochlear implants, cardiac devices. And these biofilm infections are relatively impermeable to traditional antibiotics, whereas phages can penetrate into these biofilms very well. And the, their use may both enable higher cure rates as well as shorter um, treatment durations. There are, however, challenges associated with phage therapy. Um, there is an absence of standardized protocol for dosing, duration, and clinical monitoring. And we don't really have validated diagnostic surrogates to monitor efficacy. My research group um, is very encouraging of the use of um, therapeutic phage monitoring. Um, particularly around understanding the distribution kinetics and the phage bacteria host interactions, including the immune response to treatment. And access to um, therapeutically useful phage is actually very variable depending on the pathogen of interest. It often involves a very detailed and lengthy process of in vitro mat and matching of your pathogen with against a library of lytic phages that might be available. And there's sort of two models for doing that, either using phage cocktails um, or the magistral phage model, which I'll come on to in my next slide. And both of these can be enhanced through AI platforms, which will allow more rapid or efficient matching. 
but we also need public private partnerships and investment from governments and health agencies into the infrastructure um, for bio, uh, biobanking as well as the good manufacturing practice or GMP facilities for production. And obviously these are underlined by regulatory frameworks that are essentially very outdated um, and you know, not really fit for purpose for uh, the use of viruses as therapeutics. Um, and particularly when we're thinking about synthetic or genetically modified phages, um, our current frameworks are very um, problematic. And so it is here that we need to have effective partnerships between consumers and regulators with the scientific community so that we can develop these better frameworks that are more modern. And finally, overcoming unfamiliar unfamiliarity is a big challenge, despite the fact that you know, phages are ubiquitous in every environment, including the entire human microbiome, they're really neglected in both medical and microbiology teaching. Um, and the medical community as a whole has had limited experience with um, therapeutic use of phages. And so we need to promote learning and both consumer and clinician confidence by collating standardized data from clinical, rigorous clinical trials and large patient registries. And this greater education of the medical professional will actually enable appropriate public health messaging. So these are the two models that I was talking about. The magistral phage model essentially starts off with a pathogen that's been identified that's very well characterized and then matched against one or more lytic phages. Um, and these are individually prescribed to the patient. So this is precision medicine or bespoke therapy. The alternative is similar to how we use antibiotics and it's more empiric where you have a cocktail of phages and you start with the infectious syndrome and likely pathogens and you select an appropriate off the shelf cocktail which has been pre-approved for a specific indication. And that might be early colonization with Pseudomonas and CF, it might be an infected bones or it might be Staph aureus bacteremia. Each of these models can be optimized through the addition of companion diagnostics, for example, in matching the antibiotics that you're going to use with the phages. There are also specific opportunities for phage therapy in pediatrics. The safety of phage therapy has been well established through the inclusion of children um, in some large early um, studies, as well as more recent pediatric case studies, which have shown that even with very prolonged use, there's really minimal side effects. The inclusion of children in clinical trials will also provide important additional data on phage, bacteria, human host immune responses, given the um, uh, age-related changes in these responses through immune maturation. And arguably children have more to gain from eradication of problematic infection. And again, going back to the example of um, a pseudomonas infection in, in cystic fibrosis, um, eradicating early colonization and restoring normal lung growth and development has substantial benefits for life expectancy and long-term burden of care. And so it's essential that future early phase clinical trials actively include children. There are, however, outstanding questions for clinical application. So the in vitro results are often very poorly validated to in vivo outcomes. And this is partly due to the non-linear kinetics of distribution of these living entities within blood and tissues. There's a predator-prey model where the predators are the phage and the prey is their bacterial target. And um, they interact in very complex ways um, it, which is made even more complex by the immune, the host immune response, because the human host is responding both to the phages as viruses, to the bacteria, and to the lysing of bacteria by the phages. And we know that the multiplicity of infection, or the MOI, is actually critical for phage efficiency, but it's at the site of infection, and this refers to the number of virions you have per bacterial target. But often we don't really know or can't access the site of infection because it might be deep inside the lungs or deep inside a bone. Um, we also believe that in high burden infections, the development of phage resistance might be problematic. And as I alluded to earlier, phage antibiotic interactions are actually very complex and not easy to predict and so have to be tested for individually. 
Although phages penetrate very well into biofilms, their penetration into granulomas or intracellular penetration is not fully resolved. And there are immune modulatory effects of phage therapy that we're only just starting to understand. And so these multiple challenges and outstanding questions within the diagnostics and the therapeutics and the biobanking all overlap and all have to be dealt with sort of at, you know, simultaneously through the like a research trans, you know, translational pipeline. And of course, they're, it's all underwritten by the regulatory frameworks in which we're, we're currently working in. So when I briefly mention a couple of cases that we've treated here at um, Sydney Children's Hospital Networks, at the moment we're the only site in Australia treating children. And we first treated a child, a seven-year-old back in 2019, who had a very extensively drug-resistant pseudomonas um, bone and joint infection. And she was the first child treated in Australia with um, phage therapy. We acquired the phage on compassionate grounds from the USA and she received a two-week intravenous course. Since then, we've also treated a couple of children with cystic fibrosis um, who've had uh, Mycobacterium abscessus pulmonary disease. And here we pioneer, pioneered the first use of genetically modified phages in Australia. And these phages were acquired on compassionate grounds from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and as is typical of you know, treating mycobacterial disease, these children are receiving very long courses of around a year of intravenous phage therapy. Um, Although the seven-year-old with the bone infection and, and at least one of the cystic fibrosis patients, we could demonstrate clear therapeutic benefit. Obviously, with these very small case numbers, it's too early to make any firm conclusions about efficacy. But what we can say is that we've confirmed, as we've predicted, that phage therapy is very safe and well-tolerated in children. And certainly in our center, we're growing in confidence in being able to offer this as a therapeutic option for our patients. And despite the fact that these patients were all treated on compassionate grounds, so on clinical need, we were determined to learn while we were doing the treatment and particularly trying to answer questions around dosing and kinetics and um, of you know, phage distribution and also bacterial eradication, as well as the immune responses to the treatment. In terms of um, the trajectory for Australian um, uh, you know, children in Australia, we suspect that there's going to be ongoing need for treatment of compassionate cases. Um, and from this, we want to build a national registry um, where patients are treated and monitored according to a standardized protocol. And this will allow us to generate the evidence that's required to um, rationally design um, uh, clinical trials that will help us answer questions more definitively, taking advantage of innovative methodology, which will account for some of the heterogeneity in both the patient populations, the infections with which they present, and the products with which we're treating them. Um, obviously, this is incredibly collaborative work, um, which is both um, interdisciplinary and interinstitutional. Um, and I've got about 100 people to thank, some of whom are listed here. And happy to take questions at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Dr. Shaffa Waters um, for her talk. Thank you, Amina. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to bear with me while I'll make sure this uploads. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm going to um, introduce you to mini lung organs and how we use them for personalized medicine. And in um, the last um, few decades, a lot of evidence has um, emerged that indicates that the substantial proportion of the variability in response to drugs is based on the individual's genetics. As a result of that, the goal of modern medicine has been to develop a predictive tool to be able to aid successful delivery of individualized therapies. This goal, to some extent, has been realized with advances in the field of stem cell biology. There are different types of stem cells, the embryonic, the induced polypotent, and the tissue-specific adult stem cells. The latter is what I will be um, talking to you about today. So the tissue resident stem cells, they're present in many of our organs, including the lung and the gut. And for today, we're going to be talking about the stem cells of the lung. 
and especially the lungs epithelium. These are stem cells because they are isolated, cultured, and differentiated from the patient that they originate from. They can be used in modeling different disease, and they can be used in drug screening. As such, allowing us to have a personalized approach to delivering medicines. Now, just a bit of background about the lung epithelium, which is quite complex. It's a pseudostratified epithelium with the basal cells, the stem cells being at the basement membrane. And this basal cells, it has the potential to renew itself, but also it can differentiate and make a lot of different cells which have different functions at our, and are needed to have a functional pseudostratified epithelium, which has a beating cilia. And it produces mucus. And as Amina mentioned, sometimes this mucus can turn into a biofilm and it can trap lots of different bacteria or viruses in it, which can be moved with the ciliated cells and the rhythmic beating of the cilia. Now, to be able to create this complex system, outside of the human body and in the lab. To start with, we need to be able to isolate the stem cells. And these stem cells, they can come from the upper respiratory, such as by brushing the inferior nasal turbinate, because they can be used as a surrogate for the lung airway epithelium, which is a lot harder to get to. The nasal um, epithelium can be collected while the individual, the donor, is still awake. Whereas if we want to reach the lung, we've got to be thinking about an anesthetized and, and a donor which is going to not be awake. So um, to collect the lung cells, this is going to be either done by a brushing or a biopsy, or what we have um, what we have developed is by collecting the bronchial lavage fluid, um, which has the dislodged cells of the lung in it, and we, rec we recover these cells and we conditionally reprogram them, which means that we expand them on a bed of feeder cells and we, we give them a lot of growth media, which allows for these stem cells to repeat that cycle of making more and more of themselves. And the reason that this is needed, this expansion of the basal cells, is because to be able to do drug discovery and drug efficacy and develop these platforms, we actually need a lot of cells. Once we have expanded the basal cells, then what we need to do is to actually differentiate them to be able to reproduce and recapitulate the, um, the epithelium lining, uh, lining of the lung. This is done quite neatly in uh, different ways. Um, one of the most common ways is to grow these basal cells for nearly a month um, on a porous membrane, only giving them media at the basal site. So they are air exposed. And what this achieves is reformation of the lung epithelium. And as you can see in this video here, you've got the ciliated cells, which are at the apical side. And the basal cells, the P63 red cells, are at the base of this um, pseudostratified epithelium. Alternatively, and more recently, we've been managing to create mini lungs by embedding the basal cells into a gel-like substance such as matrigel. And this allows for the basal cells to aggregate and differentiate, creating these wonderful spheres, which are hollowed in the middle. They sometimes have mucus in them. Cilia is facing inwardly, and the basal cells are on the outside. And they also here is the cilia, they are drug responsive. So if we introduce certain drugs to them, which allows movement of water and the movement of water is always one directional. So it goes into the lumen of the sphere. We can see that these um, mini organs are actually functional. So this is what we've been doing since 2017. My team and I have been um, creating over 200 of these nasal and bronchial um, stem cells and biobanking them. Majority of these are from patients with cystic fibrosis and some from healthy individuals and some with asthma. What they can be used for is, of course, disease modeling. And we don't have to be limited to cystic fibrosis and asthma. And with a lot of the healthy individuals that have donated samples, they can be used for recreating other respiratory disease. 
So as I mentioned, most of what we do is cystic fibrosis, but of course, when the pandemic happened, a little bit of our research was directed towards how can we actually help and understand the microbial interactions with COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 agent. So very briefly, what we did, this is an example of precision medicine, so not personalized, not at an individual level, but more of a group level. So what we wanted to know and understand was the difference in the age which we could observe with the microbial um, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So as a result of that, we cultured the airway epithelium, the nasal epithelium of a group of children and some of the adults. And the age range was from 65 to one years of age. To these airway um, um, cells, after they have been differentiated, we introduced SARS-CoV-2, the Wuhan strain, and infected these cells for 72 hours and looked at the downstream effect of the virus on the cells. And what we could see from early on was that the virus infected all of the different age groups, but the way that the cells were being infected and the number of virus replication in these cells was actually quite age dependent. And so was the response. So if you look at the volcano plots here, looking at the older adults at the left-hand side, you can see that the response to the virus, so this is the host response to the virus, is actually quite minimal. When you at the number of dots which sit at the top here. This is showing you how many of the different transcripts, the different genes are actually differentially expressed. And when you look at the younger adults or the children, you can see that the response is actually quite greater. Many more transcripts are being differentially expressed. And what that meant, what that meant was, this is um, an AI driven, so this is not in vitro assay, but an AI driven um, indication of what drugs might actually work best in the different age groups. We could see that certain drugs are gonna be more responsive in the older adults compared to the children. So this work is still ongoing and I will now concentrate on what we've been doing for the past few years, which is personalized medicine for cystic fibrosis. There are other aims that we follow with cystic fibrosis, but for today, I'm just gonna tell you about how can we use these models in order to be able to test the drugs which are currently on the market for certain people with CF, and then how we can repurpose these same drugs to deliver them with the other CF patients who actually are not eligible to receive these exact same drugs. And the reason for that is because CF is actually quite a complex disease. Although it's a monogenic disease and there is one gene, the CFDR gene, which is malfunctional, but there are many mutations, over 2000 mutations that can actually cause this malfunction. The gene itself, it produces a protein, which is a ion channel. It sits in the epithelial lining, and that's why the um, epithelium and all of the um, introduction that I gave you about the epithelium is necessary. And that's because this is a disease of epithelium lining. When the chloride channel cannot work, the fluid movement is halted. Without the fluid movement, the mucus becomes sticky, turns into a biofilm, traps bacteria, Area. And we are going to have a lung, in, uh, lung environment, which is going to be amenable to bacterial and viral infections. Now, there has been a breakthrough in the field of CF. We still don't have cure, but we've got something which is as close as it can get to finding something that resolves a lot of the problems that the patients with this disease um, encounter. And this is called targeted therapies, and it's a small molecule, a number of small molecules, which are targeted towards the CFTR protein. So by targeting these small molecules to the protein, we are correcting the protein. And by correcting the protein, we can see clearly that there is a great increase in lung function, and the life expectancy of the patients also um, impacted and improved. Now, as it is with biology, it's not simple. As I mentioned, the CFDR doesn't have a single mutations in, mutation in it, but over 2000, which means that the protein can have many different 
reason, different ways of being dysfunctional. And as a result of that, not a single drug, not a single small molecule is gonna be effective in actually treating every individual. And what has happened as a result is that now we have drugs which fix the gating or the um, protein getting stuck in the ER membrane or those that actually require just to produce a bit more protein. So there are many small molecules that have been um, developed, some of which are already on the market, some of which have been approved by PBAC, some which are still not approved, and we've got others which are in clinical trials. So the big problem that arises and the challenges which we face is that which one of these drugs should be given to which patient? To some extent, the drugs have been tailored. So we know that certain modulators should be given to patients with a certain mutation in the CFTR gene. But even when we do this, even when the drugs are given to patients with a common CFTR mutation, Delta 5 or 8, the response in the population is actually quite heterogeneous. We have some individuals who improve, but we've got some who have no improvement or even worse, their lung function actually deteriorates. So with a drug that ranges between $280,000 to $400,000 per patient per year, you probably don't want to give this drug to someone whose lung is actually going to deteriorate or they're going to have liver problem. So how do we go about choosing which patient is going to be the responsive patient? On the other hand, we also face another challenge, and that's the challenge of those individuals whose mutations are either so rare that the drug companies, they actually haven't been testing their drugs against. And because these are so rare and the number of individuals worldwide with these mutations are so limited, clinical trials don't make economical sense, which means that a lot of these patients with CF are left behind not receiving the modulators. And in effect, we know that some of these individuals will respond to modulator therapy. So, a way to use these culture models because they are created from the individual's own stem cells and they actually have the genetic and epigenetic makeup of that individual is to use these models in the lab and introduce the different drugs to them. But we need to also develop assays to be able to actually measure CFDR activity. And one of the more common assays and the gold standard assay is to actually measure the CFDR ion channel using electrophysiology, which I won't bore you about. The more fancy one and more palpable one to see is an assay that has been developed recently over the last five years, which doesn't actually measure CFTR itself, but it measures fluid transport as a surrogate for CFTR activity. And this has been developed in these mini organs in the mini spheres, and it follows a logical pattern of thinking. So if you recall, I told you the middle is hollow, we've got mucus here, cilia is beating inwardly, and CFTR, which is a channel is going to pump also inwardly, which means that when CFTR is functional, we are going to have swelling of these organoids. Now, if you think about a CF patient with a dysfunctional CFTR, the goal is to introduce a drug and hope that the drug is going to correct CFTR and therefore for the swelling of the organoids to happen. As you can see in this video in the middle, with this individual, patient A, the drug has been introduced, but this patient is not responding to the drug. Now, if you look at the right-hand panel, the right-hand panel patient B also has the same mutation as patient A. The same drug has been provided to the organoids, but as you can see here, you can see a clear swelling of the organoids over the 90 minutes that they have been exposed to this drug. So, Without even going through using a lot of formula and algorithm, one can say that patient B is responsive to this drug, but patient A is unlikely to be responsive to this drug. So as a case study, 
this is how we have also applied this um, platform to understand the response of an individual with a very rare and unique mutation of CFTR. It's actually in a domain of CFTR that was only recognized a year ago. And we believe that there is only two people in the whole world with this specific mutation, I37R. So what we've done with this individual cells is that we have actually compared it against other, other the organoids that have been derived from patients with known mutations and known effect towards the modulators to be able to actually say if this individual with the unknown mutation was to receive one of these modulator as a monotherapy, how would they respond to it? How would they respond if they were to receive the same drug combined with another modulator? And what would happen if that individual was to receive the drug as a triple therapy? So, of course, this is very exciting, but unfortunately, it is still very much limited to what we can do in the lab. In a similar fashion, as Amina mentioned, a lot of what we do is cutting edge and it requires regulation to come into effect. Use of organoids is considered a companion diagnostic, but to go from the lab and take this into clinic, we still need to demonstrate more efficiently that what we can see in the lab and the drug response in the lab actually mimics what happens in the clinic. Over the last five years, there's been multiple studies from Europe and US to suggest this. There hasn't been an Australian study yet. And our hope is to be able to have an N equal one adaptive clinical trial design in Australia to be able to demonstrate this. So eventually what can happen is by testing a patient's organoid in the lab against the modulators or novel drugs, a clinician can then use that information to make informed decisions about what drugs should be provided. Thank you so much. This has been a blast over the last four years and it could have not been done alone. So there is a big team to, um, to thank. There are a lot of people whose work I haven't managed to present in, in this short time. But thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, um, Amina and uh, Shafa for uh, two uh, really fascinating presentations. Um, both around precision um, therapeutics and um, quite innovative and, and novel approaches uh, that we heard. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Craig Munns, who's endocrinologist and the Advanced Therapeutics Lead at Westmead, and Dr. Laura Fawcett, who's Respiratory Consultant and Advanced Therapeutics Lead at uh, Randwick, who will facilitate the, the Q&A. And thank you very much for um, uh, posting a few questions already, but um, and please um, keep uh, our panelists uh, are keen to answer them. So please add them to the list. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I might start, uh, if it's all right, with the first question to Amine. Uh, it's from Ben Murray. Um, Is there an existing pathway for phage therapy access in children with highly problematic infections? And uh, is there uh, an exemplar of, the, of an existing national treatment register similar to that envisaged for phage therapy? Um, so I guess the second half is easier to answer. Um, and we are lucky in some ways of being able to follow in the footsteps of other um, giants and sort of advanced therapeutics with sort of gene therapy and CAR T cell therapy. And so, yes, there are, there are um, developing uh, national registries in other fields. Um, and we will hope to emulate those kinds of registries um, for phage therapy. Um, the, the, the slight complication being that a part of the um, great thing about phages is their host specificity, but that's also one of the limiting factors when we come to use them as a therapeutic because it does mean that every single um, patient is getting 
a unique therapy. Um, and so trying to unify that all is, is a little bit complex. Um, in terms of the frameworks for access, at the moment, um, access is either through compassionate access, so, so Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA, special access screen. Um, the, the route is complex um, and it's around getting access to GMP grade phage products. At the moment, we don't have a GMP facility in Australia that can produce um, that quality of phage. And so we're reliant on um, overseas suppliers, but those facilities and those um, infrastructures are being developed as we speak. Um, and hopefully in the coming years, access will be a lot easier and more streamlined. The alternative is through clinical trials. Part of the problem with that is that, like with any drug development, children are almost always excluded. And that was part of the reason why for my talk to just say, you know, there really isn't a reason to exclude children from clinical trials of phage therapy. It is so safe, um, but we probably are going to be more reliant on investigator initiated studies for children. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Chef, I've got a, a question from Peter Barclay for you. Um, he's asking, what is the relationship between a specific mutation organoid um, and the specific mutation of the organoid's response to a target drug demonstrated in the experimental model and the actual clinical response in a patient who has that same mutation. You're on mute, hon. Um, hi, Peter, thank you. Um, it's actually a great question and one which has been debated and still is under debate. Um, so there, there are a lot of R values that come out and we look at them and we say that is this R value good enough to correlate the in vitro work with the um, in vivo work. And the difficulty I believe is because the in vitro response that we get, whether it's going to be specifically measuring CFDR activity or water and movement of um, and fluid movement is one dimensional. Um, the body is quite complex when we talk about clinical outcome. The clinical outcome with these modulators is not just limited to how the patient's lung responds. Sometimes the lung may not necessarily improve, but you can see that there is improvement in the BMI and there is improvement in five other um, clinical outcomes. So so um, to some extent, what we know so far, especially with rare and unknown mutation, is that there should be a cutoff in the in vitro model. And when that cutoff is reached, you know there, there is no doubt the patient will have a response and it's going to be off a positive response. We cannot make any conclusions about how their liver is going to work against the drug. But the response is the, the correlation at the moment is quite strong, still needs extra validation. Um, another question for Amine. It's a two part question again. How does the human host recognize the phage particles? And is there a risk of antibody uh, development to repeated phage dosing? Yeah, um, so the phages are viruses. And so, yes, they're, you know, foreign um, beings. And so our immune system will re react to them. Um, in terms of how it is very idiosyncratic and, and it's part of the reason why we're doing the kind of work that we're doing to try and understand the immune response to the therapeutic process because some of that is going to be targeted against the phage some of it is targeted against the bacterial infection and part of it is actually um against the, the lysis process. So when the bacteria lies and release cellular components, then there's an immune response to that as well. Um, so the immune response is actually very complex, but yes, you can develop antibodies to phage. Um, and that's one of the things that we look for when we're treating patients for long time. So it's probably not as problematic for short courses of treatment, but when you're talking about a year of therapy as we're doing with some of these children with mycobacterial infections, we are actually looking for neutralizing antibody as a marker of, um, uh, as a predictor of sort of failed therapy or, or something like that. Um, so far in the patients that we've treated, we haven't detected it, but we know it does happen. It has been documented for patients. In terms of repeated doses, um, so yes, it is problematic for patients who require very long courses of treatment. Um, we assume that most patients, even with nasty infections, 
for most bacterial, so not mycobacterial, but just standard bacterial infections, will only need short courses. And so probably antibody um, is, is might be relevant for clearance of phage, but probably isn't going to impact significantly the efficacy of the therapy. Thanks, Emily. Um, so Shafa, uh, Martin Donnelly has got a question for you about the advantages and disadvantages of lung versus gut derived organoids for evaluating response to CFTR modulator therapies. Um, thanks, Martin. Um, so I, I didn't really talk about the gut organoids, but of course that's, um, that's something that, that is happening globally and um, the actual foreskulling swelling assay was developed in the gut organoids. Advantages of using the gut is the fact that it can be stored for far longer and it can go through that replication cycle of making more and more of the basal cells a lot easier and a lot faster than the upper respiratory, the nasal and the lung epithelium. Um, in my opinion, um, and, and some of our colleagues, most patients are happy to provide nasal uh, brushings multiple times, but to get a patient to provide a rectal biopsy, which is how you can create a gut organoid, is gonna be a little bit more challenging to, to convince. Um, in our hands, creating organoids from any type of epithelial cells, which is in the respiratory or the gut tract, so creating the organoids from the sinus and then testing them with these methods is giving the same response. So whether it's the nasal origin, the lung origin, sinus, or the gut, when we are testing them for one individual in these assays, we are receiving the same response. So I would think that if we are moving forward, we would be thinking of using the nasal epithelium as a way to move forward to take this into clinic. Thank you, Shefa. Um... M&A, Luch Della Posa wants to know, can phase therapy be used for systemic fungal infections? That's a fantastic question. Um, so as I mentioned, bacteriophages are, are bacterial viruses, and then they uh, infect and attack um, pro prokaryotes. They, they don't really attack eukaryotes, and fungi are eukaryotes like mammalian or plant cells. Um, <sighs> In saying that, um, so, so, so they're, they're, you know, the traditional mechanism of action of going in, replicating and lysing is not the way you would use them for fungal infections. There is some work, however, being done, not by our group specifically, but looking at how phages can actually be used as antiviral agents and, and as antifungal agents. And where they, how they work in that way is, is a little bit different. It's more about the interactions between the different organisms. So <clears throat> the virus interacting directly with another virus to inhibit it as, a, as, a, as you would like a small molecule inhibition type thing. Um, and then with fungi, there have been some, some work in vitro, but looking at um, uh, phages of, for example, Pseudomonas um, inhibiting um, Aspergillus, um, not directly, but through uh, altering the milieu. So um, it can change the iron content. Um, it can inhibit biofilm formation. So yes, potentially um, phages can be used against um, uh, fungal infections or the bacteriophages that I'm talking about. Fungi have their own viruses, obviously, like um, all living things have their own sort of pathogen loads. Um, but because microviruses attack eukaryotes and our cells are eukaryotes, their use is probably going to be a little bit more complicated. Thanks, Eleni. Shafa. In the theme of this talk being viruses are the cure and talking about phage therapy, are there other uses for the airway organoids in terms of drug discovery other than the CFTR modulators? Um, thanks, Laura. Um, yes, yeah, so there, there were a part of what we do, which I did not mention, which is drug discovery. So, so far, all I've told you is drugs which are currently on the market, how can we get them um, to 
to actually tell us which patient respond or how can we repurpose them. But a big part of what we do in the lab, so actually um, look at drug discovery, whether this is gonna be repurposing drugs which had a different intention um, and we are now testing them for CF as, um, as such there is a drug which is actually an anti um, oxidant drug, which we first test, thinking that it was going to raise the um, level of antioxidant, which is quite low in uh, people with CF. Um, and uh, we realized that not only it raised the antioxidant, the, the oxidant level, it was also working as a antimicrobial against Pseudomonas, and at the same time, it was activating CFDR. So it's quite exciting, and where you can go with the field is actually, um, it, it's, it's quite exciting and a lot that can be done. Thank you. Um, a question here, um, m &A is about the, the mode of delivery of phages. Um, and it's a question about, can they be more delivered more effectively to the lung via a bronchoscope rather than um, parenterally? Yeah, um, so absolutely. Um, I've only mentioned intravenous therapy. That's the only thing we've used um, for the children. But I mean, phages can be applied in any route of administration. So orally, topically, uh, nebulized. And there's quite a lot of work being put, uh, done by our colleagues in the School of Pharmacy and the University of Sydney looking at nebulized phage therapy, particularly for CF patients. Um, you can definitely do that. And we have also used um, endobronchoscopic administration for um, one of our CF children. And I often get asked why that and why not nebulized. And the, and the reason around that was the licensing of the genetically modified organism and, and release into the environment where we um, were not allowed to give it nebulized because that would release into the environment, whereas um, topical administration via the bronchoscope was permitted. And so we have done that. Um, and absolutely, um, the phages need to get to their target. So any way you can get them in proximity um, would work. And so, uh, yes, all of those routes of administration will be and ha have been used and will be explored further to find the optimal routes of therapy for different infections. Thanks, Amine. So, Shafa, in terms of other therapies that the CF patients might be using. Um, people talk about cell therapy, gene therapy. How are the organoids helping with that discovery? Um, thanks, Laura. So um, there, um, as, as I mentioned with modulators, there's still not a cure for CF. We are still thinking about just tailoring the drugs to fix the protein. But with gene therapy, we'd be looking at one layer even further in to target either the DNA or maybe delivering and have an RNA, um, um, RNA delivery to create the correct CFTR. Um, with the organoids, there are two ways that we can use them and um, using them at the moment. One is to actually proof of concept to know which type of vector is going to work better. So whether we are going to be using a lenti vector or if it's an AAV or if it's going to be some sort of liposomal vector, that before it's actually introduced into even an animal model, you personally introduce it into an organoid model because majority of the work done so far is happening on flat one-dimensional model which don't have the complexity of having mucus and cilia, which means that when you're adding these viruses or you're adding the, um, uh, the liposomal zones, they just get absorbed into the cell. So that's an advantage of having a system which mimics the, um, the human lung a little bit better. Eventually, I think where this might go is that um, you can actually correct the cells in vitro. So you've isolated the cells from little Johnny, you're correcting them in vitro by adding a um, say a safe lentivirus which is going to deliver the correct CFTR and the cells are actually corrected. These are the basal cells and the basal cells can be then delivered into the lung, let's say by bronchoscopy and hope that they are going to actually then 
home there, make more of themselves. So this is a work which is um, happening in University of Adelaide with David Parson and Martin Donnelly, and we're collaborating with them on that. Thank you, Shreki. Um, Amine, this is a question that comes from a participant who has cystic fibrosis. Um, and that they mentioned that they're able to get generic phage cocktail from the Ukraine. And it seems to be reasonably effective uh, for their own lung infections. And the question really says, why can't we get similar uh, in Australia, considering that phages are not on the poison schedule and appear harmless? And states that for Ukrainians, the generic phage cocktails are the first stop for any illness. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So uh, not myself personally, but my colleague John Idea tells stories of patients who come to his clinic with a case full of phage that I've just that they bought over the counter and ask him to to to, to give it to them. Um, the, the problem with that is that yes, phages are safe in and of themselves. However, their manufacturing process is quite complex. You do need to eliminate endotoxin. You need to make sure that what you're giving to patients is sterile and safe and free of contaminants. And so we don't know what you're getting from overseas and we can't quality control that. And it's that quality control, that QAQC process, which is critical for any intervention. So that's the first safety thing in that you want to know exactly what you're getting and what process it's gone through. And so that's why we have the TGA and why we have the EMA and the FDA, where they set in regulatory standards for how things are produced that are going to be used therapeutically. I agree that if you're going to consume it orally, it probably doesn't matter. It's about similar to having some probiotics from the supermarket, because you probably are all being exposed to phages all the time anyway. Um, but when we're talking about intravenous use in, you know, interarticular, endobronchial use, we have to have, have certain standards for any therapeutic agent. On the other hand, I, myself and the group that I work with, I don't think it's okay to say, let's just give it and see what happens. Just like anything, we need to understand it. We need to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, so we can be consistent and we can learn from these experiences. And if we don't have that consistency in terms of what we're giving to patients and how we're giving it, we can't learn from it. And that's been the problem with a lot of the older literature because people were just given stuff and no one knew exactly what they were being given and how it was being monitored. And so for all of these reasons, we do need to think of phages as drugs. They're not really drugs, but in a similar type of way and to be able to do them in a scientific manner where you can actually precisely measure what you're giving, where it's working and what the effects are that you're seeing in all systems, both at the site of infection and elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Is that time question. for the last question, Chris? Yeah. And so I'm going to ask this last question to, to both people, to both Amina and Shafa. Um, if they could comment about, um, so you just mentioned, Emily, that the phage should be treated like a drug and the organoids, the term companion diagnostics being mentioned by both of you. If you can make a comment about is the, and you've both touched on regulations, about the, the current regulations in Australia and getting these products and technologies through, what are your biggest hurdles in the next couple of years? I'm happy to go first. <laughs> um, I mean, so I can speak from the experience that we've had in so far with the, the patients that we've treated. Um, the regulation that exists it is not made for use for, for a lot of these advanced therapeutics. So for example, when we were trying to get a license for a genetically modified organism, most of the regulation is about environmental release and these phages have got no impact on humans. And yet you have to fill out these, you know, 100 page forms to try and get through the, the that regulatory um, process. And so I think it's about that, that thing I was talking about, having a partnership with the regulators, with the consumers, like the, the, the person who asked the previous question, where we can come up with practical solutions to, to put in frameworks which are more fit for purpose for our current era of advanced ther therapeutics, where we're using viral vectors, where we're using viruses as therapeutics. And I haven't even touched on the use of phages as carriers of antibiotics to the site of infection. I mean, there's so many ways that we can use um, phages. 
as I'm sure Fat Shaffer can talk about how she uses her organoids. So um, I don't have a clear cut answer, but I think that this is a conversation that needs to happen and it needs to happen soon so that we can actually move forward with actually getting these into the clinic and into the patients. Uh, I don't think I've got much more to add to this. I think the, the problems are very similar. The, the, two, the two technology that we're using are different, but what we face and how we have to actually resolve it is very much um, how do we actually educate the regulators to understand what it is that we're doing and how do we actually get past what is already written, which most of the time does not apply to what we're doing and actually try to uplift that and make it actually applicable to what we do without having to wait five to 10 years to make that happen. Um, so maybe a way forward would be um, a precision medicine discussion with the regulators rather than each one of us individually trying to target and address this. Um, cancer precision medicine seem to have somewhat had a little breakthrough and be able to deliver drugs a little bit easier than us, maybe because of the, oh, this is so terminal, we need to actually make this happen a bit quicker, which doesn't necessarily apply luckily to cystic fibrosis. So I think maybe a united front and an approach which is going to be many different uh, scientific advances, but the endpoints very similar. It all comes down to precision and personalized medicine. Thank you very much, um, Shafer and Amina, on two uh, really stimulating, great talks um, right at the forefront of uh, advanced therapeutics, precision medicine, and really generated um, extraordinary um, interest from the audience. So thank you very much, audience, because really a number of questions, uh, and we've only got to about half of, the, um, half of the questions that have been flagged, and we will get back to you. Um, we've answered the rest of the questions. Um, in the next week or so. Um, so thank you everybody for participating today. Thank you also to Laura and Craig for facilitating um, the QA. And, and for those who work in the, in the background, um, Elaine and, and Jess, thank you very much. And once again, thanks so much to, to the staff for uh, participating in this um, fantastic webinar uh, led by Amina and Shafa. We look forward to the next one in about two months time. And, um, and keep safe until then. Bye for now.